I'll leave the jumping to Zach. Hello everybody, Martin here for cgboost.com and welcome to this new video where I will give you a quick breakdown of my Blender project that I've made for the recently released Substance Painter Launchpad. Throughout its creation, I gathered some useful tricks and tips that I want to now share with you. So if you're thinking about making your own animation, this might be just the thing for you to get you started. Oh, and if you don't know about Substance Painter Launchpad, definitely have a look at this video. The link is in the description as well. And there you will find out what the course is about. It's a comprehensive beginner to intermediate course that will take you through a series of projects where you will step by step learn all you need to use Painter efficiently and creatively. But now to the actual breakdown. All right, here we are in Blender. And this is how my scene looks like when rendered in preview rendering mode. Yes, I used Cycles Engine for the final version of the video, even though when I was building it, I was initially using EV to speed up the environment creation process. At some point, the details, especially when it came to lighting and texture details, were just not good enough. However, I really do recommend building your CG sets like this, first experimenting with the lighting and composition in EV, getting the basic shapes and colors right first, and then only if need be, switching to the slower cycles rendering. Here in my case, you can see the switch was quite substantial, even though the lighting setup almost didn't change, it still got very much improved, of course, at the cost of losing the real-time rendering advantage. Now to break up the scene, let me actually take it from the most important object. It's Barry the Barrel Bot here, one that I've already talked about in the previous design process video, and also the main hero, so to speak, of the whole Substance Painter course. He's actually the model you'll be working on in the intermediate section of the course, so we will get to know him quite a lot there. And also there is this barrel hidden under several planks and with the smart materials that you can create in substance, it was actually super fast to just put the same type of metal on the barrel as I put on berry and then cover it with some quick rust and dirt materials. There is actually a special lesson for that in the course as well, so be sure not to miss it, it's in chapter 10. The rest of the environment is a different story though, it's basically a hodgepodge of various assets I've made in the past, like the whole environment for example, based on the post-apocalyptic warehouse tutorial by Blender Guru. Yep, back when I was starting with Blender. Ah, good times. Thanks Andrew. Anyway, another type of objects are these here. Well, I gotta admit these are from Megascans library, since it's just so versatile, fast and easy to use. Really recommend it, it's especially great if you're working on your artwork or video alone and want to build complex environments without spending gazillion years on them. So I had these barrels, plastic bottles, pallets and other models from there. Third asset type I used for these was stuff I downloaded from Blendswap, where you can also find a lot of useful stuff, like this collection of planks here by a user called Oliver MH. I took these, retextured them in Substance Painter and voila, it fit right into my environment. This way I put together my whole scene quite fast and was able to focus rather on what was happening in it. Which actually brings me to the first tip that I've learned when making this video and that I wanted to share with you. Tip 1. Know what you're making. Sometimes in fancy studios it's called pre-production. Yep, no matter what you think about it, you won't cheat this one. If you want to make something presentable in a reasonable amount of time and make the deadline, you should start with preparation. Uh, what do I mean by preparation? Well, it's not just some fancy concept art pieces, it's mostly the amount of time you spend thinking about the overall idea of the video and how well it will work when it's actually finished. Because it's pretty pointless to destroy yourself working hard on something only to find out you did not think enough about the fact whether it actually should exist. So that's why we spent a lot of time discussing ideas with Zach, trying to figure out how to make the idea for the trailer funny, but also somehow explain that it's not only about this cute robot, but also about textures and texture passes. Which I hope we succeeded. Only then did I very quickly draw concepts and storyboards ideas for myself, only to have a rough image in my mind of what I was actually doing, what the camera moves should be and the overall composition. 
this intense, ideally quite short period of time when you're thinking about how to develop your idea the best way possible is really something that can make or break your projects. Tip 2. Decide what's necessary and what's redundant. If you're making a video by yourself, this tip is absolutely vital. Usually you just don't have the time and resources big teams do. So you always have to play this game, constantly asking yourself what's really important and where can I actually save some time and energy. In my case, for example, I had a storyboard and ideally I would make an animatic and only then start animating the scene. Sadly, there was no time for that. And since I was quite confident at that point that I know what I'm making, I could declare the animatic non-vital and proceed without it. Other examples of this are dotted all throughout the scene. Using pre-made assets and mega scans is one thing. Then, for example, instead of a proper sky, maybe some animated clouds or a moving video here in the background. All I have is an image of a sky I took on my recent holiday and it's just moving to the side. And it doesn't really matter in the end. Instead of adding some physical simulation to the various elements in the environment, like this grass, I actually added a simple deform modifier and on it, in the graph editor, I just animated this noise modifier. Also, making nice only what you see on camera is very important. And that's also exactly why you do the preparation and storyboard so that you don't end up modeling or polishing some spots and assets that are actually not visible in the final scene. In the end, it's all about this. Try to always think what's important to fulfill your overall goal with the video. Anything that's not leading to this goal is not that necessary and you don't have to spend as much time on it. And then, ideally, find some creative and easy ways to save time on these secondary tasks. Tip 3. Write down what you need. I know what you're thinking, now this is really getting boring. But no, actually, there is a real sense of fulfillment and even healthy pride in the act of writing down what you need for your project, for example in a simple Excel sheet, and then seeing it slowly fill with completed tasks. To be honest, I've never been much of an organized person. Probably just the necessity of my freelance life made me better at this. And one thing I never omit is making it a small Excel sheet where I list various stuff I know I'll be needing for my project. In many cases, these sheets then grow and grow and grow. But luckily, this was not the case of this trailer. You can see this here was very simple. First, I have this shot tab where for this, I only really had three shots. The first long one, the extra close up. Uh, this was an idea by Zach. And then the ending, which is basically the continuation of the beginning shot. Then I usually put in what I need to learn to achieve these shots, which you can see here in the learn section. Based on that, I learn some tutorials or buy courses and go through them. I then proceed with analyzing my concepts and storyboards. And based on that, make some sort of research, running around the CG stores and learning what I can buy or download for free. That's here. After that, I have this stuff that I absolutely need to create myself, which in this case was mainly the robot and the barrel and some of the foreground models. Then it's mostly about what I do with these assets. So here I have the rigging stage and the animation. Scene indicates the readiness of the shot's environment. Sometimes I like to also add a lighting column. Not in this case, because it was also interconnected. And finally, I have a tab for render and compositing. This is all green now, yes, and at the beginning it was all red, meaning that I haven't even started it. When I worked on these points, I made them orange, and if they got blocked, I made them gray. It's a very simple system, really, and you may question whether it's really that necessary, since it's almost laughably basic. Well, after several finished projects, I can tell you it is. It makes you more confident in always knowing where you are at, what you need to do next, and how much stuff remains unfinished. Tip 4. Keep scenes organized. I know. This is almost like a 3D world equivalent to your mother telling you not to forget warm socks when you're going somewhere cold. But yes, you absolutely should keep your scenes organized. And for that purpose, I mean not only naming your objects, but mostly collections. Most often, you encounter a foreground, midground and background organization style. I often use this for my still images. 
On the other hand, for animated ones, I like to divide my assets into static and animated collections and then divide all this into more collections there. But it's really up to you. Main thing is keep different assets on different collections so you can later very quickly hide them or if you want to save some performance, even deactivate them with this check icon. That really speeds up your scene. Tip 5. Start animation from the basics. To be honest, this was really my first larger keyframe animated project where I've done the animation myself. And as such, it was a huge experience for me. Of course, I'll be first to admit that the animation is by far the weakest aspect of the resulting trailer, but still, I've learned a lot by just attempting it and I really wanted to share this tip with you. So, when animating, you need to start with the basics first and that at least in case of characters, should be the walk cycle. It means that you just put your character on some sort of driver and figure out the path on which it will move first. Only then you start adding the primary movement, a few keyframes here and there on your rig. Only when you see it's not really sliding on the ground, that the speed of the movement of the body and limbs seems natural, you can start adding secondary movement keyframes. Yes, this is something I should have taken much more seriously in the development. I should have worked more on contact of the feet with the ground, on making the robot not float so much and adding more weight to its movement and each stride of its feet. Instead, I may have been focusing more on stuff that was fun, but you know, secondary, like the hand movement, the eyelid closing and opening, the scanner and the antenna. Oh well. But, you know, there's also a different lesson there. Uh, recognizing when your result is good enough, at least good enough for meeting the deadline and actually finishing the project. Because ultimately, I still think that if your project makes sense for you, it's always better done than perfect. Of course, it's always better done and perfect, but that's another story. Tip six, add secondary animation second. Now, what I will say may seem contradictory to what I said in the previous tip, but actually the secondary animation details are as important as primary, only they should really be done after you're sure that the primary stuff works. In case of this scene, for example, this keyframe animation of the rag being swept by the falling logs and the grass, cables and bushes swaying in the wind. Actually, for these cables, I used a very simple armature I parented these to it by using the armature deform with automatic weights and then added only one keyframe to it and again used my favorite animation modifier, the noise, with these values. This way my cables are almost unnoticeably swaying in the wind, but it's there and it gives the scene some sort of movement even though it's almost invisible. The same goes for these bushes, I actually have these from a Blender Guru tutorial as well. Oh man, these Blender Guru references are getting out of hand. But yeah, it was useful. You can still download this bush from a link in the description of this video and on it you will find these branch deformer modifiers, which again I just keyed and then added noise modifier on them. And thus they sway. More importantly, the secondary animations on the robot, I think, added some sort of personality to it. The movement of the antenna, the reaction of the eyes, the poses of the hands, this is what made Barry, Barry. So the lesson is, figure out the primary stuff first, but don't underestimate the secondary animation details. Tip 7. Don't be afraid of render farms. For the longest time, I've actually hesitated to use the services of specialized render farms. I've rendered my videos overnight, suffering long hours of not being able to work on my project, simply because the system was calculating frames and it was too slow to be able to work on anything else. It was on a few previous projects of mine where I really had to deliver the results in time that I realized I have to discover how to speed up my render workflow. Otherwise, my computer would just burn down. As a matter of fact, a few years back, when I was still rendering on my laptop, it literally burned down. So it's not really funny. In the case of quality render farms, it really is very easy to upload your projects, specify the rendering settings and then get really fast results, having final frames delivered in minutes rather than hours. 
And that is a substantial advantage, especially when the deadline is giving you heart attack. I mean, yes, you will spend money on a quality render farm. And if it's long video and large resolution, we are talking about a substantial sum. If you're a hobbyist, then yes, it might not be that necessary. But in that case, there are also free solutions. There is, for example, Sheepit, the free shared rendering platform that you can use at any time. I've rendered a few frames there and yes, it works. In all cases, let me tell you, without the need to stress excessively about rendering, you will be able to make your future projects that much more interesting. And also, pro tip, try to always incorporate the cost of a render farm into the budget of your future projects. Tip 8. Don't forget compositing. This is not a Blender related tip, though it could be of course, depending on what software you decide to use for this purpose. What's important though, let the rendering phase not be the last one you make on your project. Be it artwork or video, always do some post-production. Of course, this video is almost ending, so I can't really tell you how to composite. It's a complex discipline, one you can get into quite fast, but you will never stop discovering its deep and fascinating rules. You can be compositing your images in Photoshop or in Blender. You can be putting CG shots together in After Effects, Natron or the software made most for that purpose, Nuke. I know that in my case, majority of my shots would simply not look that good if I didn't use compositing. Heck, even the holographic effect I've done in post. You can do so much with this, combining various render layers, add dust, lighting effects, subtle glow and even depth of field or more motion blur. This will inevitably elevate your renders to a much higher level. So here we are at the end of this video, I hope you liked it and now I would really love to hear your comments and ideas and maybe any tips that you've learned throughout making your own projects. Definitely share them down in the comment section and I think we will all learn something there. And with that I'd like to one more time mention the recently released Substance Painter Launchpad course based on the reviews, people seem to really enjoy it and I'm constantly working on improving it and adding new lessons to it. So if you'd like to learn Substance Painter or Blender of course, now is as good a time as any to do it. And CG Boost might be just a place to start your own creative journey. So until next time my friends, Martin for CGBoost.com, out. Oh, that? Yeah, I'm a fan of ancient Greece. Go to my channel to learn more.